opportunities to uh, to have our culture accepted. You ain't gonna stomp out no fire like that, are you? Huh? Oh, of course not. Don't want to burn your shoes. <laughs> I don't like for all things to be the same. And I think as a country, we're kind of, we're heading towards that. Everything's getting to be the same. Everybody listens to the same music. Everybody shops at the same stores, no matter where you go. I like the hillbilly stereotype, to be honest with you. I would much, you know, it, it, it makes me proud to be from a place like that. When all the world, America, whatever seems to be going in this one direction, it's nice to think that there's still a place where you know, we're still people, you know, still do certain things. They can, you know, they raise gardens and they they have a real sort of community. People wave at you, you know, kind of thing. It's definitely a revival time for old time music right now. Maybe that's even why I got into it. Maybe somehow I caught on to this revival. I don't know. Uh, I don't foresee it ever going away. I got into old time music because it's very much the kind of music I can foresee myself playing when I'm 60 years old. You know, Lord willing, I live to be 60 years old. One thing, there's probably more access to these old recordings now than there ever has been, you know. There's, there's really a great love, especially on the West Coast now, for Appalachian traditional music, which is kind of funny, but there are a lot of people from this region who've transplanted out there, and I think they search for that identity that they may have felt like they lost, and the music's one great way to make a connection to the past. What we're finding more and more is that there's been some kind of a turnaround and that there, um, uh, there's a lot of young people who are coming back to the music. So there's that whole element of people. I played to some of them in New York when I, I was afraid to go on stage, but the place was packed. And, and they were, it was just a, an amazing audience. And these were all young people. I said, how old do you think that these people are? And one of the producers said, they're old about 20, the oldest about 28. I think there's definitely a revival because I've, I've sold a lot of artwork to, a lot of my old time music inspired artwork to a lot of people from California from people from New England. The last 10 to 15 years, there have been uh, these almost super groups that play old time music. Uh, with the digital age as it is, I, I feel like it may be stronger in a lot of ways. Uh, some of the traditions will change though, I think. Uh, learning tunes is a lot different today than it was even five years ago with the media as ex accessible as it is. A tradition that was almost silenced has now been resurrected, with universities throughout Appalachia now offering degree programs and credit opportunities to study and research Appalachian mountain music and culture. The beautiful sounds and styles from the Appalachian mountains can now be heard from a new generation, bridging the gap to the old. 
allowing the world to see the unique qualities and timeless beauty of the land known as Appalachia. The second film you're about to take a look at uh, is called Tobacalacha. And again, it deals with, uh, in this northeast Kentucky quadrant, uh, coal wasn't so prevalent as a way of life. Uh, in this part of Kentucky, that Moorhead situated is, it is in eastern Kentucky, but uh, geographically it's northeast Kentucky. And again, it's not a hotbed of uh, production or jobs or, uh, you know, it's a, it's a lack of, of a lot of industry. So local people relied heavily on logging and tobacco farming. And uh, tobacco farming in, in this part of Kentucky was generally a family-ran operation. It wasn't a factory farm by no means. Um, very few people in our region grew uh, a large enough amount of tobacco to that be their only job. Uh, tobacco farming in eastern Kentucky, northeast Kentucky especially, was uh, a type of job that you could have, type of farming you could have that you could still work your 40 hour a week job and come home and work uh, this crop. You know, tobacco is a pretty strong crop when, once it gets going. Um, and this was a supplemental income. This is what people use to pay uh, grocery bills, uh, to pay off, uh, especially Christmas you know, and, 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 you know, harvesting time. Well, you start starting this early spring, you plant your seeds, you know, by, by, you know, late spring, early summer, you set the tobacco, it grows all summer. By the fall, you cut it in the field, uh, you hang it in the barn, and by the time it cures out and you tuck it to uh, the uh, tobacco warehouses, it tended to be around late, uh, around Thanksgiving, around early December, so it gave families a lot of money for Christmas. Uh, but it was a vital part of, of the livelihood of, of our region for a long, long time. And into the 19, early 1990s, into the mid-1990s, uh, the government uh, was taking a lot of um, flack for uh, the government supported the farmer. And in the state of Kentucky, you were guaranteed so much money uh, if you raised tobacco, whether your crop was good or bad regardless. The government started taking a lot of criticism for uh, supporting and paying farmers through the agriculture department to raise something as, uh, as negative as tobacco had become for health reasons, for uh, you know, cancer, and uh, you know, just the overall negative aspect of tobacco. So Sharon Denham, a uh, re retired uh, nursing professor at uh, the University of Ohio, in Athens uh, approached me. Uh, she had a grant uh, and she was studying tobacco's effects uh, in, in central Appalachia, especially with diabetes. And, and she uh, asked me if I'd be interested in producing a documentary about tobacco and the role tobacco played in people's lives. And originally this piece was going to look at more so health, you know, because central Appalachia has the highest smoking uh, rate in, in, in America. And uh, as we started producing the documentary, it became clear there was this weird romanticism about farming. You know, Appalachian people are very close kin people. They always remember their parents, their grandparents, even their great grandparents. And we would interview people and they would talk about their mother, their father, their grandpa, and how the family all worked together uh, to raise the tobacco and what the tobacco meant to the people. So. It took a different turn than looking at the ill effects of health. We still talk about health, uh, but it was just sort of the culture, the kinness that tobacco farming used to bring to our region. And it's interesting because in our area now, uh, the highly discussed uh, aspect of Appalachian livelihood is coal. Uh, you know, you see the Friends of Coal stickers everywhere. But when tobacco uh, and the government sort of parted ways, uh, you, you know, in that point of time, in the mid-90s, you saw a lot of support tobacco, support tobacco farmers type literature in different places. But this is Tobacco Latcha, um, uh, great piece, uh, glad I got to produce it. Um, this film aired on KET back in, back in 2011, I believe, and uh, yeah, so thank you all.
deaths from smoking are, in, for all intents and purposes, the single most preventable death in America and actually across the world. We have all kinds of occupational hazards related to chemical agents that might be uh, sprayed on the tobacco crop itself. Those are toxic to uh, not only lungs, but also uh, that those toxic chemicals filter into a water supply. As a health educator and a former smoker myself, one of the things I'd like to tell you is that the single most powerful way to avoid smoking-related illness is to never start smoking. First of all, it was for a long time we protected it to, to try to protect our farm economy. It has to do with the independence. It has to do with, uh, uh, again, role models and ancestors. Uh, the son of, uh, of generations of smokers just can't see why they should make that change uh, when uh, it seemed to them that their parents led a good life. Uh, and so there are a lot of reasons why it is here. I feel like uh, some of those are dissipating. When the tobacco companies pulled out of the state and uh, tobacco no longer was the, the far and away the number one cash crop, legal cash crop in the state of Kentucky, then uh, we started to see some change with smoking bans, higher uh, cigarette taxes, and things that could make a difference. We're just probably about 10 years behind the rest of the country uh, in realizing the uh, ill effects of tobacco. There were some people whose livelihoods depended on tobacco, and it was important for them to maintain their self-worth. They just could not believe what they were being told about cigarettes. They raised it, uh, they felt like their tobacco was pure, natural. Other people may put chemicals on it, but we don't it on, on my farm. So I feel like uh, the, 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 the feds are making this stuff up. So as in other areas, people started to stop, they started to quit smoking, they, their smoking rates dropped, Kentucky's just stayed higher. So I don't know, there may have been a time when our, our rates were closer to the national average, but pretty much after the 60s, after the Surgeon General's reports, other people stopped and we didn't, and so we were left with a much higher smoking rate. Used to be, you know, around uh, close to half the people in this country smoked uh, back in its heyday, uh, but uh, we're approaching 20% nationally, and we just haven't quite caught on in Kentucky. Okay, when we, when we look back historically, uh, perhaps, you know, 10, 15 years ago to about 1997, about 97% of the U.S. Uh, uh, Burley tobacco crop was actually grown in Appalachian states. Uh, in fact, the uh, 71 of the distressed counties uh, produce Burley tobacco. Many people think that uh, tobacco growing might be uh, a big production, but actually it's a sort of a family operation. And most people or most families when they grew tobacco only had about three to five acres. Uh, uh, when you consider other crops that might be grown in the area, for instance, uh, hay or wheat or soybeans, uh, corn, uh, that, that crop usually gave farmers about 500 hours or less uh, in gross receipts for uh, each acre of crop grown. Tobacco, on the other hand, provided about $4,000 in receipts. So it was a very profitable uh, crop that uh, generally had a high yield and was relatively predictable uh, for local farmers. And they felt rather confident that they would be able to have a successful crop and have this as a predictable income every year. Since the 1930s um, and before the tobacco buyout, there was some stability for price when it came time to sell tobacco, and I think, I think that had a big uh, influence on the attractiveness of, of guys getting into Burley. There was a little bit of um, security there in terms of price support. Around 2004 uh, or so, um, there was some legislation at the federal level that allowed uh, growers to be bought out, to have their bases um, bought out. There was some resistance from growers, uh, but I think looking back it probably was uh, as good a deal as they could have got. There's two sides to about any story, and you mentioned the other side to this story. There's no doubt that tobacco isn't healthy, but there's other, uh, other consequences of, of uh, less tobacco being grown. Um, so, just leave it at that. 
The earliest times I can remember, I was in the tobacco field. The time that we were together for family, um, we went out early in the morning, we came for lunch, dinner, as we called it then, and then worked until late in the evening, but we were talking and we were sharing and we were listening and learning and developing our morals and, and that kind of thing with family. My most precious memories about raising tobacco would be when we stripped it. On Saturday evenings, we had this little radio, and uh, if we were real lucky, we could hold our hand behind the radio, and it would pick up the Grand Ole Opry. We'd, we'd listen to the Grand Ole Opry, and my, my grandfather would dance. He would, he would uh, sing his little ditties, and he would dance and tell stories. And it was family time. And uh, Daddy would try to make me go to the house. He'd say, why don't you go to the house and, and warm, warm your hands? But I couldn't leave. I couldn't leave the barn. I couldn't leave the family. It was family. Um, I get emotional even when I talk about it. The, the tobacco on the farm, that was our stable. That was what brought the income. Uh, Mom and Dad would charge the groceries all the way through the year, and when they sold the tobacco, they'd pay their grocery bill. They're on Stinson Creek in McGoffin County, raising 10 children, growing tobacco. That's a very special place. It's a very special memory part of, of our culture and I know the memories that I'm telling I know that they're the same for a lot of people because I talk to them about that even with the with the negative press that that tobacco